Okay, I think we are ready to begin. And I'm delighted to, to see that we've actually got all four of our esteemed uh, panelists on the, uh, on the podium. So what we're going to do, we have until um, 3.15, we have about an hour, or maybe we'll go a little bit further, we can probably push that a bit. What we want to talk today is about media, in this session, is about media and free speech. And the, the and certainly media has played a role in many in all of its definitions. We are the, the Berkeley Center for New Media, so we're particularly interested in new media. But we're also interested in the other definition of media more broadly as the as the all of the instruments of the press. So we're going to be looking at those those issues. And as we go into it, I just want to throw out one thought from my perspective, which is something that um, has come up several times, which is a reference to um, Hyde Park, and. The, uh, this is in the Speaker's Corner, famously in London, where there is an open, essentially open platform for dialogue. And this has been going on for a very long time. And I have been curious if we could do something like this here at Berkeley. In other words, just establish a very specific spot, very clearly label it as accessible for anyone to come and speak, however heinous their message. But we would also very clearly label this as a, as, a, as a zone where we do not guarantee any protections. In other words, it's, uh, it's a, it's a, it's, 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 uh, you have to come at your own risk. What and but, pardon? Amplification? You can't hear me? No, amplification. Oh, of that. No, so you, that's another question, and I don't know about, maybe we can discuss, but I think the main thing is that you would have a place to come and speak and that it would, be a, it would be guaranteed so that nobody could say they were denied the possibility of speaking at Berkeley. But at the same time, we say that we can't guarantee safety for everyone. It relates to the question about trigger warnings and other things earlier. I think we, obviously, we, we want to establish safety, but it's to ensure it, to guarantee it for everyone is extremely, uh, extremely uh, huge burden. So rather than cutting off free speech, my thought is we, I, I would like to propose that we have an opportunity for free speech, but yet, we, we, at the same time, we say that every, it is a responsibility, both of the speaker and of all listeners, to, to, to understand the risks that are involved. And free speech has never been safe speech, as the free speech movement um, participants from 1964 are well aware, because it was they put their bodies on the gears and the levers of the structures. And so they were not afraid to, to take risks at that time. And I think we need to re respect and understand that as well, that, that free speech does carry risks. So I know that's going to be controversial, but I thought we'll throw that out there uh, just to get the, uh, get the panel started. All right, so the first speaker is going to be Nick, um, Nick Radlau, who is, a, uh, is getting his master's in the, uh, in the School of Journalism. And he also has a background, he's, uh, he's got his degree undergrad from art practice and rhetoric here at Berkeley. And he's a practicing artist and he's worked with Ralph Nader. So please welcome Nick. So I just want to start off first by establishing some of the context of what these events uh, and events like them around the country have sort of been cropping up for. And it's easy to see if you look on social media. It's just actual commentary by students who find particular speakers and their ideas to be problematic. So I'm just going to read some of them. Um, these are recent. They were from June. It says, quote, the various actions undertaken by the university have contravened the spirit of respect, tolerance, equality, and earnestness, the ethos w upon which the university is built. These actions have also dampened the acad academic enthusiasm of students and scholars. If the university insists on acting unilaterally and inviting the speaker, our association vows to take further measures to firmly resist the university's unreasonable behavior. This individual is then called an oppressor, an ethnic secessionist, and he's attributed with the deaths of innocent people in the panic among the general public, as well as actions that triggered riots and protests. Now, who do you think this is? Is it Milo? Is it Anne? Is it Ben Shapiro? It's the Dalai Lama. These are quotations taken from students who were speaking out against the Dalai Lama. And do you think this is in a deep red state, in some you know, rural town? This was in San Diego, California. And these were students who were speaking out against the Dalai Lama, students of color, who were saying that this individual should not be able to speak because his, these were the viewpoints that these students held in a very sincere way about the Dalai Lama. And I want you just to think about that and kind of bracket it in your mind. Um, what did these students ask for? They asked for the university to intervene. So I think the first question you have to take up then is, well, what is a university? 
A university is, at some level, it's programs, it's students, it's it, the way that those individuals interact. And it's also an institution with laws. It has the ability to enforce these laws through a security force, through a police force. You've seen the UC campus police. And I think at its heart, it is also a public space. Now, public spaces have been eroded over the last few decades, and they continue to sort of change and evolve, which is understandable. But the space that we tend to frequent the most, at least my generation, is maybe social media. And that's an interesting space because that space is both public and private at some level. It's private in that we can control a lot of the levers of it. We have the gears that we can sort of touch. We can unfollow, unfriend, or block somebody. And it gives us a sense of we have control because that happens at every single level. I mean, if you even follow Trump, maybe he'll sort of block you, you know? Um, and, and that's a pretty interesting thing that, that, that can happen in that kind of exchange. And it allows you to narrow cast your community. It allows you to sort of dial in to the specific individuals and voices you would like to hear. And it's also portable. You take it everywhere with you. Your phone is always with you. And I don't think I've ever sat in a class much to my sort of pain that somebody isn't on Facebook sitting in front of me like typing away. Um, so this is something that we take into the public space. So you could always sort of like exit and enter into this like semi-private space. It's only semi-private because corporations are constantly monitoring what you're doing and then selling it off to other corporations. But going back to that, what does the law say about public space? Well, the law is very clear. The law is clear on the issue of offensive speech. It allows it. It doesn't allow all speech. It doesn't allow violent speech that incites violence in, in an imminent way. It doesn't allow for sexual harassment, libel, and there's other sorts of restrictions, but it allows for offensive speech. And that isn't to say that the things that people like Ben Shapiro or Anne are saying are not problematic or hateful, that the emotional trauma that is triggered by hateful speech does not lead to actual physical pain and suffering through stress or sort of issues that are sort of uh, more widespread in the psyche of an individual. Um, and it's not to say that it isn't hate speech. I I'm not saying that the, the law doesn't take an, a, a position on that. And it's a cop-out to say that the laws are this way, so they almost always have to remain that way. That's a total cop-out. Laws can change, they have changed, and they've changed a lot of times for the better. And so you have to ask yourself then, is offensive speech something that we do not want to allow? Um, also, what is the nature of the campus and should it change? Should the university that is a public space at this point shift so that it allows some more of the controls of a private space? The thing that I think you have to think about then is what is the problem with changing the law? The problem, as far as I can see it, is that you don't always control the law. More than Milo, more than Ann, more than Ben Shapiro, the tools that were given over to Donald Trump were given to him by Democrats. Obama was the one who amassed the ability to use drones in almost a unilateral fashion. He was also the one who cracked down on whistleblowers. And he was also the one who mobilized and developed an infrastructure to deport thousands of migrants from this country to the point where Al Jazeera called him the deporter in chief. Now, those were tools that were given over to Donald Trump by a democratic institution. And, and the view, I think, was, because I worked for an independent the entire time, uh, Ralph Nader, was that individuals didn't want to openly critique him because they said, no, no, he's a Democrat, you know, he understands how to use this stuff. But then somebody like Donald Trump takes over. So to circle back just to the beginning point, both the Dalai Lama and Ben Shapiro did get to speak. Those are two individuals who were sort of uh, can, um, either fairly or unfairly, in the case of, I think, the Dalai Lama, critiqued for being oppressors and so forth. But if you were to make the law or the controls that the university could shut down a particular speaker, what are the metrics on which you base that? How many are the students, how many students? Is it the type of students? Is it if it's the students of color, if they're a minority group? Well, how do you define that? And is it the sincerity of the students? If one student or a group of students believes sincerely that this individual is problematic, do you then act? Or in other words, how can you always be sure that if you make a law that you will be in control of the law? And if you can't be in control of the law, what, would, what will protect you when someone else has it? Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Nick. Yes, okay, so I'm gonna invite Rebecca to come next, and we have slides for her. And Rebecca Leviton is a PhD student in the Department of Art History 
here at Cal. She has a specialty in, um, in the art and architecture of ancient Greece, which I, which I hope will become uh, valuable in this context. And she also has her BA in art history from Emory and um, an MLIT in ancient history from the University of St. Andrews. She's a field art archaeologist in Greece and Italy. So please join Rebecca. Or please join me in welcoming Rebecca. Is this on and appropriately loud? Okay, so um, as has been implied, I am not actually an expert on new media or anything new at all. Um, but I do spend a lot of time thinking about media and one medium in particular, sculpture. So my role today will be to talk about how this sort of traditional medium has come to the fore once again in this fraught political moment. The same forces that are increasingly raising questions about the limits of free speech in the digital sphere have also recently drawn our attention to a problem which seems anachronistic and wholly analog. What should we do about statues which seem to endorse, incite, or condone actions that are no longer considered appropriate or even humane? So this type of art has its roots in classical antiquity, the period I study, and very problematically, it continues to be conflated with this ancient tradition, both democratic and imperial. Um, however, these works of art, there we go. However, these works of art and the messages that they convey have been thrust into the contemporary spotlight. Most notably, we think of the recent events in places like Charlottesville at another state university, where a rally around the removal of a Confederate monument escalated into a tragic and fatal incident this past August. Much of the media coverage on this issue characterizes the Confederate monuments as catalysts for conflict and violence. However, I believe there's something to be learned from the historical use of statues as loci for a dialogue. People have used public art for productive conversation for hundreds of years, and this approach, when complemented by the power of new technologies, could provide one potential answer to the complex question of monuments, artistic legacy, and memory in the United States. So after the events in Charlottesville, our president has made his opinions very clear about the beautiful statues and many people disagree with him on a seemingly infinite number of ethical grounds. So some advocate for all of these problematic artworks to be pulled down and destroyed. Others think they should be relocated to museums or sculpture parks where they can be further contextualized. And others still, even those who do not like these monuments, feel that removing them would be wrong because it's an attempt to erase history. So of course, like any complex issue, this has to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis with the full involvement of the public, and in this case, I agree with the point of Daniel Sherman. And this is also where historians and art historians can be put to work to help answer some of the tough questions surrounding these monuments. Not just who they represent, but how they're represented. And not just why the statues were erected, but when they were commissioned and the political stakes at that time. So, of course, this is a sensitive topic for scholars of material culture like myself. We've been conditioned to fear and resent iconoclasm, but it's also what we've been trained for. My personal interest in this um, issue derives from my dissertation topic, which focuses on a sculpture that's been used for just this, a place of anonymous public dialogue, for more than 500 years. And this is a living tradition. This sculpture is still used for, uh, as a gathering place for political commentary to this day. So this is the Pasquino group. It's an ancient sculpture depicting a warrior recovering the dead body of his fallen comrade. It was excavated and displayed near the Piazza Navona in Rome, and right in 1501, right at the turn of the 16th century. And the sculpture's reputation quickly spread after it was draped and decorated with Latin poems by members of the public for a religious holiday. Interestingly, these poems were written from the point of view of the sculpture rather than the authors, and the practice of using the sculpture as a locus for posting poetry to be spoken by Pasquino was quickly democratized. Uh, this sculpture became a popular unofficial location for anonymously posting satirical poems or commentary that often criticized current events and authorities like the papacy, and these were gathered and published in a pamphlet every year, so there's been a pamphlet every year since 1501. Pasquino provided an anonymous voice for the people of Rome when they could not express their views openly. Of course, then as now, not everyone who wished to make a statement was in a position to compromise their own safety. And the posting of poems on the Pasquino statue was a nonviolent and widely accessible form of resistance, which made the artwork a place for gathering and conversation. 
Eventually, five other marble conversants around the city joined Pasquino in a so-called Congress, and attempts by the papacy and other authorities to suppress the voice of these statues has been consistently foiled. To this day, the sculpture continues to speak through a notice board where people post their thoughts in many languages, which you can see, this is a current photo, and also he has a Facebook page. However, unlike an online message board, the posting on the actual statue and the contextualization of the sculpture in real time and space makes the consequences of the posting seem real to the public. An anonymous author has the ability to watch others read their contributions and hear their opinions, and this phenomenon provides a venue for sharing and validation, eloquent listening, without the consequences of social shaming. But the analog setup also allows for an unofficial social code to be enforced. Hateful and bigoted messages rarely stay posted for long. Often we think of monuments as static, the, sculpture, the sculptor petrifying a moment in history to be remembered long after it's occurred. But the Pasquino demonstrates that public statues, especially those in gathering places, are adaptive and can be effectively animated or activated by their passerby. A simple QR code and a phone can allow anyone to express their opinions about a statue or even use the statue as a vehicle for expressing themselves. And statues can be displayed in dialogue with other monuments, which might provide alternative narratives. Here again, we might follow the lead of the Pasquino sculpture in creating our own 21st century Congress. And this is something that I believe the city of Lexington, Kentucky has done very effectively. They removed all their Confederate statues and reinstalled them next to Union statues. Um, so I'd like to reiterate that this isn't an adequate response for all offensive statues, but I leave, believe in this case it's a positive first step. However, not all cities are like Lexington, with already extant spaces for monuments al um, honoring alternative narratives. And in these situations, we have to create these spaces, and we have to create these opportunities. This is a sentiment that I think is more eloquently expressed by Nikki Green. And once again, we can think about Hyde Park Corner dedicating a space just for this, this purpose. Um, also in London, just like Hyde Park Corner, we might think of the fourth plinth. This is in Trafalgar Square, a place right in the center of London, and a space that honors British military histories, many of whom have their own problematic side. And there they've kept one plinth open for a rotation of publicly commissioned statues. And these often bring attention to marginalized groups that are not in the same uh, category as those honored by the original monuments in this space, such as this monument, which uh, honors a handicapped person. So the fourth plinth then activates a dialogue with each new sculptural installation as it's changed out. A new campaign has recently taken the idea of historical speaking statues even further. And this has happened in places like London, Copenhagen, Berlin, and Chicago, where residents can submit narratives for public art, which are then voiced by actors. Um, and these narrations or monologues that are narrated by notable actors are available through an app, which uses a QR code on the base of the statue and is easily accessible. I think this is a great idea for cities. Uh, why not allow the public to not only submit applications for the official narrative, but also contribute their own opinions and counter narratives to the statues? With an implementation of a program like this, cities can create nodes of communication for far less than the cost of policing some of these problematic statues. And the same technology can be used as a data gathering tool which surveys visitors for their opinions on these statues. So the issue of offensive and problematic public art doesn't have one easy answer. However, I believe that whenever possible, we need to allow these statues to speak through placement and dialogue with other sculptures, which provide fair and honorable representation to marginalized groups, and by using new technologies to connect art with the voice of the public. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. And our next, uh, we will, I will invite um, Lawrence Rosenthal to present. And so wait, here we go, there we go. Um, Lawrence is the chair of UC Berkeley's Center for Right-Wing Studies. And I'm going to let that linger in your mind for just a moment there, because as it did in mine, he's going to explain his perspectives on this, which is fascinating. He was a uh, visiting uh, scholar at the Institute for the Study of Social Change here, and he's also been a, um, a, a he's taught in the departments of sociology and Italian studies. He was a Fulbright professor at the University of Naples in Italy. And he's currently working on a study of the contemporary American right. 
in comparison to movements of the right in 20th century Europe. So please welcome Lawrence. Thank you. Um, and thank you to the people who organized this. Uh, my name's Larry Rosenthal. As you've heard, I run the Center for Right-Wing Studies here at UC Berkeley. It is the only organized unit on any campus in the United States, or abroad as far as I know, devoted to an academic understanding of the goals, the thinking, and the organization of right-wing movements in the 20th and 21st century. So, in short, I spent a lot of time and energy, um, I, I, much of my time and energy is, is spent doing things like following right-wing blogs, websites, and other publications. And given this specialty, I thought long and hard about what I might bring usefully to this conference. And I concluded that what has made free speech such an overriding issue today, and especially on this campus, and what has made the argument about free speech radioactive is violence. So I'm going to bring up a word that I bring up with only the utmost reservation. I, I, I've done this sort of thing these kinds of talks for about 10 years, and I've never used this word. And the word is fascism. And as you'll see, it is a matter, in this case, of self-definition. Uh, more than any time in, in over 50 years, Donald Trump's 2016 campaign provoked a serious discussion of the, le of the threat of fascism at the level of presidential politics. Um, you know, this is very distinct from the use of fascism as an epithet, which goes both left and right. Martin O'Malley, you might remember, was a candidate for the Democratic nomination. On two occasions at presidential debates, he called Trump a fascist, Out, outright. Conservative New York Times columnist Ross Douthat um, began considering the question of Trump and fascism as early as December 2015. Um, Robert Kagan, kind of the eminence grise of, the, of, of neoconservatism, published an article called uh, uh, On Trump, How Fascism Comes to America. Um, and so the discussion of fascism started with recognizing Trump's scapegoating, ethnic state scapegoating, this conjured up. Um, you know, Mexicans um, and, and Muslims. This conjured up the fear, the first inklings of fascism. Also, his hints of violence um, that, that you can probably recall, he would say things like, you know, go beat that guy up. Um, when the good old days, he'd go out on a stretcher. Um, I'll pay the, the, the legal fees and Second Amendment people might be able to take care of Hillary Clinton. Second Amendment being gun people. Um, and the closest example of systematic violence, however, was simply online. It took the form of doxing and, and other forms of, of, um, of threats and intimidation. Um, what you didn't get was an organized kind of militia. You didn't get people who were following Trump who organized in militia. And this is the signature of a fascist movement. Um, they, they used to call what they did in Italy um, punitive expeditions, fighting on the street. Um, and today, systematic alt-right violence that was once confined to the internet is changing. And it changed right here in Berkeley. It changed in the aftermath of what the far right calls the Battle of Berkeley, which was August, uh, April 15th, I think. Um, and it changed in a way that, that Robert Reich hinted at this morning, when he, which he called crowdsource 
violence. Um, and in effect, what, has, what is happening now is that the punitive expedi expeditions of the alt-right are moving from social media to the streets. You may be familiar with Richard Spencer. He's the so-called founder of the alt-right. Um, when, after the Battle of Berkeley, he was astoundingly excited. <laughs> um, we have entered a new world, he argued. We have entered a world of political violence, and I don't think anything is going to be the same. The actual footage of the video is quite beautiful. Um, he says, I thought political violence would never occur in my lifetime. We are back to the 1930s. Two different camps that saw each other as existential foes, fighting for ideological space. We have two different parties. This is all new. Let me parse that. What he's referring to is Weimar Germany. And what he's referring to is the confrontation on the streets between Nazis and socialists and or communists. Um, his view is that the fragmented politics of the US have now, have now gone to the um, extreme where people are going to be forced to choose between one or another side of extremists. Um, I, now, I certainly regard this as, as exaggerated, but it is what um, is behind the thinking of what is the alt-right is now bringing to you know, university campuses. It was the thinking behind Charlottesville. Um, at, at, uh, after Charlottesville, um, Richard Spencer had a, a press conference. He found the, uh, the torchlight parade absolutely beautiful and magical and mystical. Um, and he used an old trope of Mussolini, which is, we only act in defense. This is a quote, the alt-right is nonviolent. Everyone knows this. Um, he, he went so far with that argument as to describe the guy who ran over Heather Heyer as acting in self-defense. Why do I bring this up? We as a community need to understand what we are up against in terms of what the alt-right has in mind. They have presented themselves as warriors in the name of free speech. The confrontations they have participated in have given them a propaganda bonanza in the ironic name of free speech, which plays brilliantly on Fox News and in the hearing rooms of the Senate Judiciary Committee. It is an excellent strategy. It presents institutions like the University of California with drastic choices between free speech and security, issues which are under scrutiny at this conference today. Let me leave you with two more quotations from Richard Spencer. One, the conviction that history is behind him. Um, he, he argues, quote, white dispossession is so real, so obvious, that a reaction had to occur. And finally, the second quotation is remarkably similar to the sentiments of the fascist avant-garde in, say, 1920 Italy. American society today is so fundamentally bourgeois. It is just so, pardon my French, it is so fucking middle class in its values. There is no value higher than having a pension and dying in bed. I find that profoundly pathetic. So yeah, I think we might need a little more chaos in our politics. We might need a bit of that fascist spirit in our politics. Thank you. All right, good. So we're going to open it up for questions in a few minutes, but I'm going to, um, Ed is going to be our fourth speaker, and Ed is the dean of our School of Journalism. He has, he's written about technologies, media ownership, plagiarism, a number of topics. He actually wrote a weekly or biweekly column for 15 years on, um, on the media. And he's also been editorial advisor for the Journal of Media Ethics. So he's extremely well uh, well engaged to, to well prepared to speak on these topics. So please welcome Ed Wasserman.
Well, thank you, Ken. I was enjoying listening to the other speakers. Let me, um, le let me start by confessing that I have a dog in this hunt because I run a school of journalism, and free speech is a big deal to us. Uh, we uh, rely on it not just for the, it's, it's the water in which we swim. We rely on it not just to uh, be able to, to deploy the expressive freedoms uh, ourselves to be able to speak freely, but to be able to listen. And, and if, we, if people are muzzled and prevented from talking, then we are cut off from the information we need to truly and accurately appraise the realities that we all inhabit. I personally wonder how much of the ignorance that we went into the final, the final stages of the last general election with, how much of that surprise of finding out how much anger and how much uh, and how vulnerable uh, and and how much rancor there was in the population derived from the fact that editors didn't really want to hear about it because they didn't want to convey those messages. They didn't want to be running stories in which people were being quoted as expressing doubts about immigration, about fearing that white that their privileges have been had been eroded. These very disagreeable things that tend to be foregrounded in the kind of expression that my colleague Larry was just talking about, those things were not very present in the coverage of the electorate leading up to it. And I'm wondering how much of that was a result of the unwillingness of the press to convey these things because they didn't want to anger or, or uh, intimidate readers. Um, so uh, start with that, that I have a dog in this hunt and it's in, it's in favor of expressive freedom. Now, I came here watching Charlottesville. I want you to know I spent a prior decade in Charlottesville before I came here five years ago to become dean of the J School. So I feel a bit stretched in the kind of both the poles of the dialectic with respect to free speech. Wherever I go, free speech becomes problematized, it seems. Um, that, and and l let me also, uh, just a, a couple things um, about the... Um, the difficulty that we have here on this campus because we are an institution of public higher education. And those, we, we, lump, we lump those uh, categories together, but in fact, they confer very different obligations. As a public institution, we have a legal and constitutional duty to create, to allow a space in which people can speak their minds. Now, there may be limits to that, and there, should, there certainly should be, but those limits are pretty broad before you incur sanction. So we f operate within a constitutional universe that allows people to say a lot of unsavory and distasteful things. At the same time, we're an institution of higher education. And part of what we do is create a culture and an environment that values fact-based discourse, it values logic, it values respectful speech, it values a lot of things that we have every reason to insist upon and to encourage as part of the education you get here. So it's an interesting way to watch, and I've been at a lot of meetings of deans, it's fairly high up administratively, I'm privy to these meetings, and they really do tangle with this question. How do we reconcile these two charges, both of which are important, both of which are even sacred, and, and both of which can at various times be incompatible with one another. Um, and I want to conclude with what, I, I'll save most of my comments for the spirited to and fro that's, that's uh, destined to occur here, but I want to just point out an, an, inter an interesting irony that I haven't really been able to do very much with, that we have these two things in relation to uh, speech occurring at the same time in relation to the media, in relation to discourse, we have this question of what are the limits of free speech and which should people be protected for it and are they vulnerable and is that something that, that uh, we are obligated to, to care about and act upon. So we have free speech on the one hand and they have this fake news business on the other. And I'm kind of wondering how is it that these two things have surfaced at the same time? Are there common threads? And I expect that some of you may want to weigh in with your own ideas. I think it has something to do with the destruction of authority in the world of discourse. I, I think that we no longer know whom to listen to. We, 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 the brands that once were prestigious that we believe in are being suppressed, systematically suppressed online by the way in which internet-based uh, news is shared. 
we don't know where we're getting information from. Where did you hear that? I heard it on the internet. You, you, you get that kind of nonsense all the time. People don't understand once upon a time there was a brand that stood behind information and it conferred authority because you knew that the people associated with that brand checked out the information, they contextualized it, they took real pains to make sure what they were telling you was true. So we have this, but, and now we have this question of whether who is to be trusted? Where is authority in this kind of environment of digital populism, if you want, if you like? And, and I think that, so there's, it's, I don't know exactly what the connection is, but I know there's a connection between the fake news critique, which I think at its broadest expresses uh, a, a very strongly felt and widely felt uh, attitude of skepticism toward the news. And the news has done a great deal to earn that reputation and earn that and, and, and to provoke that kind of skepticism. So I, I view fake news as far broader than just fabrication and, and far broader than just it, content that certain politicians find unfavorable or disagreeable. I view it as a reflection of people looking at news and saying, well, I'm not sure why they're telling me that. I'm not sure what consequence to attach to that. I'm not sure how well-founded that is, how factual it is. Because they may turn around and, and, and I may find out two days from now that the reporter who did that systematically was making things up and nobody blew the whistle on him. So I, I just throw it out to you this, that this, I, I, I think to some degree, a, a disparagement or a denigration of the value of discourse as a truth-finding mechanism is something that joins these two things together. I, actually, one, one other point, going back to our reliance on free speech in the journalism business, it's remarkable to me how this freedom of expression is invariably attached to freedom to share opinions, not freedom to share facts. In my world, the most egregious and the most consequential and the most harmful Actions that are being taken by the state have nothing to do with keeping people from expressing unsavory opinions. They have a lot to do with stopping people from sharing unsavory facts. And we have an unprecedented number of prosecutions for espionage under the, under the first Bush, then Obama administrations. And we have this freeze on whistleblowers. So I think that when we talk about free speech, let's not forget it isn't just a matter of opinion that's being, that, that's, that's in doubt. I think it's more harmful and more consequential is the fact that people with publicly significant facts are being stopped in the name of national security, in the name of proprietary information, if it's private employers that are involved, that these facts are not getting out and not getting shared. And that's a much greater danger in the longer term, in my view, a lot greater danger to the kind of civic health of this society than, are the, than is the restrictions on fact, uh, on opinion. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. <clears throat> okay, so before, before we open up for um, questions, I want to exercise my pro pro prerogative as a, uh, as a moderator to, to ask a question um, myself. And I, I, I'm very intrigued by what, um, Ed, by what you just said, because, you know, I, I have to say, I think this, this question, you know, saying that, um, that this is a, a sort of a, a loss of authority, um, on the part of uh, of our institutions, of our of our channels of news, or our most august channels of, of news, are being questioned, and certainly it's true that um, there there is a matter of whether they're 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 free to report facts. But I, I think we have to admit that it's a selective, very selective lens that chooses which facts will get reported in, in an institution or a a, a, um, a, a medium such as uh, the New York Times exercises extreme uh, selectivity in what it reports. And this is a theme we've seen over and over again today, which is that we were that the New York Times was missing reporting on a number of issues that were very, very um, uh, crucial and, 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 and had been, um, and, and, and had not been reported, I think, uh, either deliberately or just by, um, by, by, by lack of awareness. And so we have to pay attention to that. There was also, and, and speak of the New York Times positively, I will say that um, there was an article or a, an op-ed by David Brooks this week, and he made an interesting analogy with um, our current administration and Abby Hoffman. I don't know if you saw this, but it was, he was basically saying that what we, the, we find this so aggravating is the, the kind of antics that we're seeing um, in the White House. But what we're also, you know, what, what he points out is that this is exactly how our parents felt uh, or, 
you know, back in the 50s or early 60s when we had antics of someone like Abby Hoffman, who's, who's, uh, who was, was really there to disrupt. It was to, he was dr disrupting the, the existing order. He didn't necessarily have an answer or a specific agenda, but he wanted to create uh, disruptions and, and spectacles, and he, and he achieved that very, very well. And it was maddening to the conservative uh, order at the time. And, um, but it did yield, it, it was a real challenge to authority, the authority of that time, and yielded a really made way for the movements that really led to, to our contemporary uh, uh, moment, or at least uh, our, our, the, 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 the authority of today, which is largely, uh, or at least we enjoy in Northern California, which is this idea of a liberal, educated, well-balanced, um, and we think meritocracy, but I think that it is important to point out that, that there is an analogy that just as aggravated as, um, those, as our parents felt, we feel a similar anger and frustration. We don't understand it, but we, if we really look back, maybe it's, it's he's doing that. He's trying to disrupt the established order that, that we have and that maybe we have to recognize that that order is, um, is, is, is worth reexamining. So let me put that out to the uh, panelists. Would anyone like to comment? Please. Is this on? Uh, okay, good. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, so that, I guess that was one point that I would have pushed back against uh, my dean on, but I think that maybe it was, I, I assume that you probably shared that viewpoint as well, which is that those older institutions, those older forms of media, while they did have like the ability to broadcast and reach a wide audience, they were also very limited in who was getting to represent their viewpoints, what those individuals looked like. Um, you know, those individuals were predominantly white men being able to share their viewpoints. And I don't have a problem with individuals that are white or male sharing their viewpoints, but it's a problem if that's the only person that's able to dispense information and knowledge to you. And I think one of the benefits that was not acknowledged that I do believe that the Dean also shares, but unfortunately he didn't say it in that in his time limit, uh, was is just that there is a benefit of this kind of narrow casting of media and the fracturing of it, which is that we're able to get more voices and more individuals to represent those opinions. And I think that's important. And I share the position, as I believe you do as well, that some of those older institutions also missed a lot of points. I mean, even in my own lifetime, the lead up to the Iraq war was you know, blatantly misrepresented by these institutions such as the New York Times. And that was a deep, deep problem. But I think that the way you were speaking to it, and I'll pass the mic to you so you can maybe uh, confirm or deny um, the statement, is just that I think you were speaking to the ideal. If, if they functioned in their best possible way uh, when the story was properly reported, um, everybody got a chance to see it, and then everybody got to comment on it and sort of and, and take a viewpoint. Yes. No, I, I strongly agree. I spend most of my time criticizing the media. I'm certainly not going to. There, there never was a golden age. I, w I was simply uh, trying to raise the possibility that the the potential for uh, people to speak with authority seems to be uh, seems to be something that's not widely acknowledged. You don't have. You don't have debates in which uh, people are actually trying to summon uh, superior arguments and better evidence in order to win. Um, you have uh, encounters that are basically reenactments or participation rituals in which people are going to make familiar points to the cheers of their followers. Um, so, I, and I think that's a problem. I mean, I can remember in the late 60s going to Vietnam teach-ins when there actually would be debates between the people in favor and the people who opposed the war. And they would try to uh, persuade each other, or at least to sway the audience one way or the other. I, it's hard to imagine how those, how comparable events could be held now, and maybe that's, that's a challenge for us. But no, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't carrying water for the media. The media had plenty of sins to atone for. That's not the point. The point here is that I, I see the destruction of the possibility of anybody speaking with authority, and I think that's dangerous. <clears throat> Although, I just, just to clarify, I, I was saying that I think this, this challenging of authority is actually uh, something very much in our tradition. And in fact, you know, that was exactly what was happening in the, um, in the 60s. I would say it was it was challenging authority then, and 
So yeah, I'm it, using the word in a different sense. I'm oh, using oh, the authority yeah. of fact, the authority of logic. The, you know, in other words, you're arguing as an educational institution, we school people, we encourage people to think of that as attainable. And I, I just fear that the culture is basically turned away from that with a tr tr tremendous skepticism, cynicism, but just a disbelief that that kind of thing is possible. And that's what I fear. That there, that there is any authority. Right. Although, okay, you go, please. Uh, so we'll I, I, th I think that goes back to the, the point that I brought up, which was the oftentimes tools or, or I, forms of logic that are used to be <clears throat> counter uh, hegemonic against the oppressor are oftentimes inverted and used by the very same oppressor. The language that these individuals used against the Dalai Lama to me are, have no attachment to reality. To call him an oppressor, an ethnic secessionist, to say that he caused the deaths of innocent people and panic among the general public, that he, his actions triggered riots and protests, that to me seems to be devoid of the re reality of who he is. And, but I don't deny that these individuals believe this with all manner of sincerity. It's that I don't know how they can anchor it in something that we can find as common truth. I think this is also some, a problem that was developed by philosophy. Uh, Bruno Latour and a lot of postmodern thinkers who were deconstructionists and tried to undermine the ideas of, of like a factual like authority, like a base of authority, said that that authority is situated within a context of an identity and a worldview and a, and a perception. And so they went around sort of deconstructing things rightfully. But the problem was that at some point, as Bruno Latour says, that the virus that they saw, or the, the thing they were developing inside the laboratory escaped, <laughs> and now everybody else has access to it. And so when I hear somebody like Donald Trump say that that uncomfortable reality is just fake news, I feel that there's a lot of echoes of the things that Bruno Latour had himself created, mm. and that he himself sort of wanted to call attention to. Also, an alternative fact. What is an alternative fact than other than just saying that, no, no, from my perspective, mm -hmm. in, in my viewpoint, that this is a reality. So I think that that's kind of what uh, philosophy did. It undermined that kind of common shared authority um, in some sort of anchor to reality. And, and that both is you know, a, a powerful tool that helped to uh, destabilize these forms of oppression, but in some ways it also gave that oppressor that tool to use against actual forms of uh, progress. Excellent point. I, I really appreciate that, Nick. I think that's actually, you know, that postmodernism, and, and actually, in some sense, it really w grew out of the, the same movements that, that the, the free speech movement and the, and the, and the 60s counterculture was the, was the origins of that as well. And so I think it's a really interesting point that that was something we championed for many years. Now it got out of, you know, it got out of, it, it escaped like a virus, and now, you know, we're complaining about it. But we ha I think we have to recognize that there's a commonality to that. Yeah. yeah I, the only thing I want to point out is that is that um, yes, those things are true, and and they've been true for a long time in the sense that it's it's an ongoing. It's like a wave, and I think the wave has crested in a new way in the era of Trump. Uh, you know, you can go back to th talk about things like, you know, um, uh, the uh, the the rise of talk radio. Uh, the the uh, undermining the fairness doctrine and and the the you know the siloing of of thought and um, but you know fake new fake news alternative facts conjures up um, uh, George Bush's regime um, in where uh, uh, Karl Rove became famous for for um, calling the media. The reality-based community, um, and and he asserted that th that um, the Bush government was now and the Republicans were now an empire, and they could make up uh, the reality that the rest of us had to respond to. I think between that and um, uh, and where we are in the Trump era, there's there's kind of a qualitative leap. Uh, from from reality-based community to alternative facts. And, and um, if I could make an analogy, I would say that, um, you know, what Fox News was to cable, uh, uh, the, the coming of cable TV, um, you know, social media um, and 
Breitbart and things like that, Breitbart is to the coming of, of social media. And I think that has, that has created a kind of qualitative leap in the capacity for reality to have increasingly little, you know, <laughs> there used to be the phrase, reality bats last. You know, it's like we're in the 19th inning now. But I want to say that, you know, we keep uh, referring back to this reality as though there is a singular reality out there. And I think we also, you know, I think we want to consider, I'm going to push back on this because part of my job is to stir up this panel here. But it, it's that, uh, that, that we want to be, you know, there's this outrage that we feel today. And I want to make an analogy that I think is very similar to an outrage that was felt by older generations in the 1960s when we challenged everything that was out there. And so there's, they're challenging all of our assumptions. So we, we, it's qualitatively different, maybe. But I think what's interesting also is to consider in that context, in that historical context, is this really that different? So let's talk, turn to our historian for a moment here. Can you take us back to ancient history and provide a perspective? Well, I, one thing I thought was interesting about Nick's comments is a lot of these insults lobbed at the Dalai Lama or Benjamin, they are the same things people were saying about Pisistratus and Cleomenes. It's the same exact stuff. So we regurgitate the same narratives, and we have been for thousands of years. But it does seem like in the past we've be had better mechanisms for, for moderating that speech and who gets the authority. There's this whole idea of the rhetorician who, through his own speaking prowess sort of gains an audience, and we don't have that online. Um, and there's also this issue, for me, there's sort of two things that have changed with social media. One is that anonymity has always been sort of sacred in this issue, and that now means something different in a digital era. And the second is that we brand ourselves through social media and we curate our own personas, and now our political views can be part of that personal branding. So some people call this virtue signaling. It's sort of discussed in a lot of different ways, but social media is now making people's political stances um, part of how they are perceived often before anyone ever meets them. So this reduces the chance of productive conversation and changing viewpoints and things like that. So those are just two, two things that weren't true in the ancient world that are now. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you. OK, and I'll let you, uh, um, actually, Lawrence, I'll let Can you speak. I but also, please uh, prepare questions. And if you put your hands up, we'll be able to come around to you in, a few, in just yeah, a minute. I just want to respond to your, your um, uh, bringing up oh, you know, David Brooks um, and uh, Abby Hoffman and, uh, and the, uh, the 60s war between a younger generation and an older generation and that sort of thing. For, you know, one thing is that Abby Hoffman wasn't president. Um, the, 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 you know, that difference, the difference in the political power of the revolting generation compared to, um, you know the the what we, what we're seeing in terms of the rise of the right in this country. It's it's a very you know the the power dimension is so different that I, I it 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 um, I think it makes the analogy um, somewhat suspect. Um, I would say that this sense that you say of of our outrage at what's going on and so forth. If you want a better analogy. Um, read the Tea Party blogs in the era of the presidency of Barack Obama. There is a, a, a parallel to the outrage that people feel about um, uh, Trump, which is, which is kind of one for one, and gets at the question of um, the gross incompatibility of views. You know the the sense of this is not my president. He can he's not a legitimate president. It, that parallel is uh, extraordinarily deep from tw tw two thousand and, and and eight to uh, to two thousand and fifteen on the right, and uh, and what is felt in blue America today. Absolutely, but that's really my point, is that the, the, the outrage is, is, we haven't been on the receiving, we haven't been the, the, the feeling the outrage, I think, uh, until recently, and now it's our turn, and so my point is, though, that there is an analogy. I think it's, it's uh, I would love to hear from others on this point, but I do think that 
there's something there in, in, in terms of um, some, some link. And it will help us maybe to understand um, and, 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 and come to terms with what's going on right now. So, okay, we have hands in the audience. I'm going to give Barbara the first, um, first one. And I ask you to keep her questions short because we have about 15 minutes for this session and, and also the answers. We'll try and go quickly. I'm going to offer a couple of speculations. Um, it has seemed to me for a while that um, the right wing intolerance of limitations on free speech may come from opposition they have found in ordinary daily situations against the use of the N word in. Uh, and uh, especially in mixed company, by the way, I, I speculate also that uh, hostility toward women may come from disapproval by women of such use of that word in ordinary social discourse, one. The other speculation is that in regard to the fake news, perhaps the um, guiding principle of these news outlets we um, uh, we, we're finding problems with, uh, do not put their primary um, responsibility on, uh, uh, on reporting truth, but rather supporting their cause and helping to win for their side. Panel? Well, I think you know, the, on the last point, you're absolutely right that uh, um, you know, this is basically what Fox News did, which was, um, you know, if you think back prior to Fox News, what television news looked like, it was somebody behind a, a table and they had reporters and so forth. And what they did is they essentially emulated that form, um, but they didn't invest in you know, somebody who's the Washington, who's in the Washington Bureau or a bureau in San Francisco or a bureau in Tokyo. They did it on the cheap and they did it by, by putting people, you know, behind these, these uh, the same uh, mise-en-scene as, as uh, Walter Cronkite, but um, uh, they were in no way um, reporting, giving reports of, Things that happened. They were they, they were occasions. There was they sat on sets, which allowed them to offer what um, is far more in the nature of opinion than fact. So who is our speaker? Right, right here. No. Okay. Pass. And um, sir, in the back. Yeah, I wanted to uh, bring up something that I think someone said in the audience uh, at the beginning of the talk about amplification. Uh, it seems on one level, free speech, I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty simple equation about, yeah, you know, even things that are, um, you know, offensive and, 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 you know, creating maybe environments about sensitivity. I think the bigger worry is about this idea that ideas are infectious and that there's a huge portion of the electorate that's very impressionable. Uh, and that um, while certain types of speech might not directly incite violence, it can influence enough people. And when you look at throughout history of various movements like Nazism and, and even more recently like ISIS and the inroads they make with a lot of young people, that certain ideas can have the power to inspire and galvanize entire communities. And it seems like there's not a lot of good levers or mechanisms um, legally for mitigating that, you know, because you want, you want to foster opinions and you want, you want a culture and a democracy where everybody has the ability to speak. So how do you, so how do you, how do you, how do you grapple with, 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 with this idea that, um, you know, that ideas can elevate, can, can reach a critical mass that suddenly um, uh, you, you're, you're advocating a, a movement of violence or a movement that's, that's contrary to even a democracy itself? Interesting question. I, I think that we are committed to the notion that the way to counter speech is with more speech. And that ideas aren't just infectious, they're not just uh, uh, you know, pathogens waiting to implant and take us over, but they are propositions that can be countered and that can be defeated. We are kind of, that's, that's kind of our 
that's kind of a, what we came in on. Uh, we, we are an institution of higher education, and that is the process that we want to submit to and encourage other people to, to operate within. I, I just want to, a little bit, there's a, seem to be some denial here in the room of the fact that a right-wing student at the University of California, Berkeley, might feel a measure of cultural isolation. Uh, and I think that we need, we'd be fooling ourselves if we didn't understand one of the things that dramatically changed from that era, the era that you're talking about, to now, is that the left didn't control the universities then. Mm -hmm. And the left controls the universities now. And I'm sort of sympathetic, I, I, I know that's a grotesque overstatement, I get it, but uh, I don't think anybody here would deny, and, and regardless of the fact that the conservatives seem to be in control of all available uh, levers of power and government and all the rest of it, you would be hard, it'd be hard pressed to deny the degree of cultural isolation and the degree of estrangement that somebody who's conservative would feel on this campus. So we are regarding them as the ascendant, as the, the elite that's in power, that's running this society, but I promise you, they don't regard it that way. They regard themselves as very much uh, kept out, very much, their ideas systematically disparaged, and they don't have an opportunity to be heard. So I, I think that we need to put that out there. I, I, if I ask for a show of hands how many conservatives are in this room now, I think we'd, oh, okay, that's, oh, that makes, so there's both of you. So, <laughs> but I think we, we need to acknowledge that, that that reality, they've been fighting oh, yeah. this for a long time, and oh. most of the free speech issues on campus from like the mid-90s on have been free speech issues brought by conservatives opposed to speech codes mm -hmm. and restrictions and all, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. So we need to sort of call that for what it is. No, excellent point. I do think, you know, as the last, um, in the last panel, it came up, do, well, how do we provide a safe space for people with conservative ideas? I completely support that. I agree. I think that we, we absolutely, that's a very important responsibility. Now, we, I see, I'm really happy to see a number of younger students in the, um, in the, in the room, and I'd like to hear from them. Uh, so anyone under 25 <laughs> wish to, to speak? Would you? Yes, so two people, but this young woman right in the middle, would you, did you put your hand up or is that just no? No, don't worry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. How about this gentleman right back here with the blue? Okay. Yeah, so my question uh, regards, you know, how effective you can act, uh, you can actually be by trying to suppress, uh, I guess, ideas uh, that you might believe are intolerant or hateful. Do you think in a way that trying to suppress those ideas, give them like a measure of validity to, you know, at least a certain group of people that, you know, by treating them as so dangerous and working so hard to suppress them, that it can make them even more attractive to some people. Maybe we can get the historical angle just because you can sort of broad sweep and sort of cover that, no? Well, one thing that, um, this is only sort of related, but one thing that in a broad sense I think is interesting is that um, we have this very double-edged sword. With the liberty of free speech also comes the consequences, and we think that uh, in places that are more sovereign or traditionally have more of a sovereign view on moderating speech, that they do not have the reward. But most of the examples we've been talking about, about the successful use of spaces, uh, monuments, uh, gatherings for people to speak constructively have been in these countries that actually have sovereign governing documents like the Magna Carta. So in the large sense, um, I mean, I think we have a very distinctive and um, idiosyncratic uh, situation in the United States and that we are founded in opposition to that. But I don't think that in places that have restrictions on hate speech, for instance, that people there feel more of a desire or more legitimacy towards hate speech. I think if we look at how events play out in the world right now, those countries that do have restrictions on that type of speech don't have more violent incidents than here. I want to just add one point to that. So a lot of people that, uh, I've had some of these free speech debates, they'll say like, well look what happened in Nazi Germany, like they have restrictions. And uh, I didn't actually know what the restrictions were. I, was, I would just say, okay. And then I asked one person earlier today, well, what are the restrictions then in Germany? And then they didn't know. They just assumed that there was all these restrictions. And then I, started, I went online and started looking. And it wasn't as clear cut as it had been made out. It wasn't like 
somebody says something that seems like reminiscent of some sort of like anti, you know, this group, and then all of a sudden they're shut down. And you can see that now in Germany, like there is still neo-Nazi parties. There's the NDP, the National Democratic Party, I believe, that merged with the Union Party and the there's another group as well. But they represent viewpoints that are very similar to what I would say is like a, a form of fascism today or a form of like, you know, sort of anti-immigrant nature. So I don't feel like censoring, uh, you know, uh, like a Nazi flag is going to essentially, you know, eviscerate a Nazi ideology. Like those things do not to me seem to make sense. For me, it makes sense more so in, in the vein of what a journalist does is that we have to seek it out and bring it out into the light and give it a critical space, a critical frame around it so that you can evaluate it within the other marketplace of ideas and understand that those ideas are ridiculous and those ideas are problematic on all sorts of levels and try to dispel it because you don't really have, I don't know what the alternative is. I mean, the alternative is what? To like just keep separating our countries into pieces so that like finally we're amongst a group of people that look like our Facebook map? I mean, I don't know what you do or how you sort of move forward. And uh, one of the problems I have also just on a historical point is our invocation of fascism. I used the word earlier just right now, and I think it's also a problem because I think a lot of times we think about fascism historically and we think of the Nazis and us taking down the Nazis. But it, it, it is utter nonsense to act like we were not racists. This country was not founded on racism, and it did not work on that basis. We might have been out there going against Adolf Hitler, but we declared war against Hitler after he declared war on us. We declared war on Japan first. We denied a, a ship of Jewish uh, migrants who were fleeing from the horrors of uh, World War II. We pushed them back, and some of them did die. But even more important than that, there was still segregation. We might have killed Adolf Hitler at some level, but we made Jim Crow here and he lived here for decades after, right? And so the idea that we went to go save humanity and, and beat down the racist people of Nazi Germany, it's just bullshit. And, and it's a part of an American idea of propaganda that I think we have to move away from. So when we talk about fascism, we, you know, the, our Nazi past like of fighting against Nazism was not born out of this moral virtue of of doing the right thing. I think it was born out of a complex series of things, and I'm sure some people were against it, but that certainly wasn't the reason why I think that animated the, the uh, our war, nor was it reflected in our values here back at home because we still segregated it against individuals and we still instituted all sorts of problematic laws against different minorities afterwards. And we still do today. And yeah, exactly. There you go. So okay. So um, any other of the young of the younger generation wish to speak up? There she is. Okay. Anti. I like that shirt. <laughs> and we're going to I, Nicholas. Should we try and get back on the schedule with the break, or should we? Can we go a few more minutes? Five more minutes. Okay. Um, my question is regarding. In the beginning, you spoke of a speaker's corner, possibly at Berkeley. I was hoping to get your opinion on it. Would it be beneficial towards us? Um, basically, any opinion. The Hyde Park thing where yeah. nobody's protected, but they can say whatever they want. Um, I, I don't like uh, the idea of sequestering a place to say you can speak your mind there. That's what a university is for. So I, I don't like the idea because the implication is elsewhere you better watch what you say. And I think that... No, that's not what the implication... Well, well, I just well, wanna, let, me, let me clarify what the point was that there would be a zone that would be clarified as a zone that where you, would, you, could, you could go and exchange ideas at your own risk. If you make that the entire university, that's problematic because then you, you're everywhere, so you, people can't opt out. Here's a place that you can opt out easily by just avoiding this one corner, as, a, as you see there. And you would have a, an opportunity, though, for that is where you would go if you needed to express something or if you wanted to go and listen. And it would just be very clearly demarcated as not a, a, zone, a zone that was not going to be where, where safety was not guaranteed by the university. That's my point. That's my proposal. So I can't disagree with it? Or oh, do no. I need to go to... I'm sorry. Maybe I need to go to that... I'll go to that corner that you're going to designate. Disagree there. All right. All right. You can disagree with it. Go ahead. No, I, I still <laughs> think that the implication, which is that speech... You need to curb your speech elsewhere, is an implication that I, that I uh, hmm. repudiate. And, and if the people, uh, my wish to reach people who might not be passing by that corner uh, is still, is still uh, alive and is still valid. 
So I, I guess I don't, I still believe that there's an implication, which is that free speech is free only in certain places and not in others, and I think we ought to battle against that. Um, can, can I just make a, a brief point, which is not to say I think it's a good idea or a bad idea, but what sort of seems to be a solution would provoke a whole lot more debate if we were to try to institute something like this. So with Hyde Park, can you stand on a box? Can you stand on a ladder? There's constantly debate about this and how it's moderated has been a big problem in that space. So that's not to say it's a good or bad idea. Uh, the second sort of question I would have is, does it need to be a real physical place? Because I do think we need a spot that's denoted for conversation, for uh, uh, a place where people can express themselves, but in this digital age, is that a real analog place? So my, I do believe that spaces, actual spaces in this world, when you exist in them, you behave differently than on the internet. Anyone who's done online dating knows that's true. And like, <laughs> and that people will share things that they would never share in real life. Uh, and I think that's true politically. Um, and you know, we do, I think there is a need for something like this, and we have little glimmers of it around campus. So. Um, some of you who have ever been in the bathrooms on Doe Library, or uh, some of these spaces where there is narration. There are people sharing their opinions anonymously about issues like feminism and getting responses. I don't know if this happens in the male bathrooms around <laughs> campus. Um, yeah, it's less, it's less developed in the male bathrooms. But we, I do see glimmers of this around campus, or like meme pages, that people seek validation through memes um, on campus. And this is a growing thing. So I do think there's a need. I think there's evidence for this need. But whether or not we need it to be a real physical space, I think, is up for debate. And if we say, yes, it needs to be a real physical space, it's going to open up a whole other set of questions about how do we moderate that space and the surveillance of that space. T to me, that, that's the area that I would be concerned about, is that as soon as you begin to allow for a certain, a separate idea, like you just give a title to this other place, even if it's non-existent, people are going to then start to ask the questions, well, okay, you know what, that's fine, but d talk about it later in that space, or um, wh who gets to control which ideas fall within the purview of that space and which fall outside of it. Um, all of those things are really complicated to me, not to mention just the violent aspect of it, that you can go speak in this space, but violence can be enacted upon you. It's like, okay, great, in Berkeley, sure, sure, I can say whatever I want, but go into, I, I traveled around the country when I campaigned with Ralph Nader, and every other state is not like the Bay Area, okay? Like, even San Diego, the Dalai Lama, if he was in that free speech zone, what would happen to him? Right? I mean, like, the guy's like talking about world peace, and then somebody is going to maybe like throw a rock at his head. You know, like, and we just go, well, that's, that's the nature of the free speech zone. Like, to me, the, those things are problematic because, I mean, and maybe, you know, I don't know. It's, I mean, it's just problematic to me. So it, it's acceptable to say if you live in the Bay Area. But if, as soon as you move outside of that space, maybe you move into Al Alameda County and, and it's different from Berkeley, but maybe you move into California and that's different than the, the Alameda County, but maybe then you move into a different state and now it's all together differently, you know, different, uh, operating on a different scale. And I think that that starts to become a problem. And from my understanding, there are still some campuses that allow concealed carry weapons. Uh, I, I can't remember if that was true. I know UT Austin was pushing for it for a long time, many years ago. Did somebody say something? Texas A&M. So w what happens in there? If I'm standing there and somebody's holding a gun and saying, well, this is my Second Amendment rights, like, I don't think that I'm going to say anything other than, like, goodbye and then, and then leave, you know? Like, uh, so I think that that creates all sorts of problems and who gets to control those levers? How do they change? I don't want to be uh, involved in that debate because I think it will always work towards uh, oppressing minorities. Okay, so we're, we are almost out of time. Um, I see a couple hands in the, here, but... Are, I think over 25, maybe not. Um, but, uh, but, but any last words from the, from the younger generation here? Because I do, I do think their, their positions and, and, and feelings are so important to, this, to the future of these issues. Yes. Um, something I'd like to sort of uh, get some commentary on is specifically on campus, a lot of what I've been hearing about the debate is like protecting free, so what you said about like protection and violence and the sort of abstract protection that is not offered in the speaker's corner. I kind of like to hear your opinions about how, I guess how to sort of decide how spending hundreds of thousands and 
possibly millions of dollars on protecting someone who's been invited to speak to the campus sort of like pushes up against protection of students' right to learn at this higher institution, sort of brought up by the discussion of um, public institution versus institution for higher learning. And I'd like to delve into a little bit more detail. I know my question is very open-ended, but if anybody has any commentary on that. There's already, a, 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 um, that issue is already dealt with in the sense that the chancellor can determine that if she uh, or he at any point has used a reasonable amount of funds to secure the campus but is unable to, that they could terminate a speech. So that's already an issue. It just has to be within the reasonable sort of consideration of the university. But then if that same sort of issue comes up with a different speaker, like how do you engage with that? That becomes very complicated, right? Like if, if it's a, a right-wing speaker, maybe the majority of the campus that's left-wing says it's okay, like it's too much money. But who gets to decide when that limit happens? Clearly $800,000, a million dollars is ridiculous. Um, but those are conversations that can already sort of happen. Like the, you, you also can't incite violence. There's, there are limitations to the kinds of speech that these individuals say, and there are mechanisms that are in place. It's just one that you have to go through. What, it, what does the term reasonable mean? But I, I, let me ask you also, I, I would say that uh, you know, you're absolutely right. One of the things that I think we're, we're going to be confronting with very soon, because it's not going to stop, is that we're going to have more and more of these, and we're going to actually end up turning away speakers increasingly. And so that's why I propose my, my suggestion, not that it's ideal, but that it's an alternative to turning people away and shutting down top speech altogether. I realize that managing it is very difficult, but that's my point. We should not necessarily try to manage free speech all entire, everywhere on this campus, but offer a zone where it can be, it can be e e e e uh, ecologically evolved and just see what happens there. That's what, that's what I want to propose. All right, I, I would just, just, just to chime in, we, we're not, we're not taking measures to protect Milo. We're taking measures to protect the university as a space where a certain kind of discourse can happen, a certain freedom of discourse can prevail. And I think that is worth a lot of money because uh, there aren't that many places in the society where that's true. So that This morning, Robert Wright called it an investment in, uh, yes. in free speech. And, and I think his point for me was very well taken. Um, but you know, the, the particular moment in which the alt-right can send in provocateurs and uh, with the aim of, of uh, provoking uh, violence, provoking the, um, uh, the Antifa, um, that's, that's, that's um, you know, the university, the university has such conflicting, um, interests you know, the, the, uh, in terms of free speech, in terms of security, in terms of, of, um, of publicity, um, that it's a very, very difficult choice. I, I'm not someone who is, who is uh, you know, uh, by nature sympathetic to administrations, but this one's a really tough nut to, to solve. Okay, Just Rebecca, the final super, word. Super, super quickly. Y yes. Um, so. I think that the argument that it's investment is valid, but I also think part of the, the goal of this university is to foster free speech. I also think this is a place of learning. And when a line is crossed, when we have to cancel other speakers because they feel threatened when someone comes to campus, when our classes have to be rescheduled, some of my students could not come to my class because they were rerouted or held by the police. When normal learning is disrupted, we may have crossed the line of reasonable that that Nick That's mentioned. That's part of their rule as well. If normal class functioning ceases to operate, then you're also able to uh, cancel the speech. So hopefully what we've done in this, uh, in this session is provoked you to be thinking about a lot of new ideas. Please join me in welcoming our, or thanking our panelists. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>